Hi folks, welcome to the third party engineering and acquisition of British Armour Group, Teabag, round two, the results. Now, I know you're all desperate to know who the winner of the three-in-one universal gun carrier contest is, but in the spirit of every true results show, I'm going to make you wait for it just a little bit longer. First off, I want to thank all of our lovely contestants. We had 19 successful entries, and my word, was the standard of work high. Some of you truly outdid yourselves. I want to say a massive thank you to all of you for taking part and sharing your awesome designs with us and letting me play with them. I also want to apologize that it's taken me so long to get these results to you guys. The judging process was long for this round because some bright spark decided it would be a flipping great idea to make a challenge where every entry was, in actual fact, three entries. This would be fine if I wasn't a working husband and father who has about one or two spare hours a week to play sprocket or make teabag happen. Anyway, mistakes were made and lessons were learned, and I've got some ideas about how to streamline things for next time. Yes, indeed, round three is just around the corner, but let's not get sidetracked. I just wanted to say sorry it took so long, and thank you for your patience. With that out of the way, I just want to also quickly address the judging process. As I said in a previous Reddit post, I wanted to broaden the scope of recognition after the first round, and to make sure that people who excelled in all areas of tank design got a chance to shine. To that end, judging categories were increased from three to four, now giving sales pitches, the depth and quality of your Reddit showcases, aesthetics, how good and appropriate does your design look, specification criteria exceeded, that is, how does your design measure up against the minimum requirements laid down in the specification? And finally, the proving ground, which assesses how useful your tank would be in the field, with an emphasis on tactical mobility. Precisely how these categories are scored will vary depending upon the type of vehicle and the specification in the challenges. And while I'll explain some of why the winning designs, well, won, I won't be spelling everything out, as I want to give you guys the chance to be creative not just encourage you to design so as to try and maximize your point score. Still, as you continue to participate, you should start to get a good sense of where my thinking lies with most of these, and I'm more than happy to give you score breakdowns and other feedback on request. Just send me an email to teabagcompetition at gmail.com or a private message on Reddit. Just bear in mind that the longer you leave it, the less I will remember. Now, on to the good stuff, the reason that you're here, the results. First up are the category winners. In the sales pitch category, our winner is... The Crucible Series by DXSC2020. I mean, wow, where do I start? This is one hell of a sales pitch. I never expected anything like this when I started these competitions. Before I get into this one too much, let me just say that the vast majority of entrants completely outdid themselves with the sales pitches this time. They were an absolute joy to behold. Thank you, all, for the time and effort you put into them. But there can only be one category winner, and it has to be this one. We have setting, date, and atmosphere all described. Thematically appropriate period photos, to ground it in the real world, a company logo as well as a name, history, background, even a failed attempt at the challenge caught on camera. There's humour, and there's good salesmanship in equal measure. But there were a number of pictures that had all of that. What truly set this one apart was the pictures. Custom edited, presumably on Photoshop or something like it, this pitch was elevated to an untouchable level by these well-edited photos, placing the design in the real world, and the variants alongside each other, all in glorious grayscale. This pitch also went into plenty of depth about each variant, and took the time to sell them to the War Office, which is the name of the game here, so of course it scores well. In depth, with top-notch pictures, good salesmanship, and delightfully in character. This pitch scored an impressive 9.5 out of 10. Next up is Aesthetics. And our winner in this category is... The A9 Sarastas by Decca Daves. Decca Daves is one of those people on the interwebs who has that uncanny ability to make it look like they were designing in a completely different and far more flexible sandbox than the one the rest of us are stuck with. And most of his designs leave me scratching my head as to A, how he did it, and B, why I can't do that. The A9 Sarastas is no exception. I mean, just look at it. 
The detail here is off the charts. Almost every panel is fully riveted, which is both period and nation appropriate. The early mid-war British vehicles relied heavily on rivets. There's innovative use of fixtures made to look like things Hamish never intended, like beefier hinges, storage and footholds. Everything feels believable, and the designs are so well thought out that they look like replicas, even though they're entirely original. They're also very British. Most people got the right decal for British tanks, except those who notably didn't. This one sparked joy. This one does not spark joy, ladies and gentlemen. You're lucky I only docked you one point for using this one. Anyway, this design got it right. But there's so much else going on here that's quintessentially British. I've already mentioned the rivets, but the general boxiness, the stance, the track type, exhaust type, road wheel choice, turret shape, even the headlights, they all echo World War II British tank design language, and I really appreciate the effort that went into that. As the crowning glory on an already hard-to-beat design, we have these external storage bins on the TD variant. Not only are they painstakingly custom-made from structural panels, but two of them have lids with stiff hinges that haven't been closed properly. What the actual... How do you even... Ugh. Decadaves, I salute you. The only thing more perfect than perfection is realistic imperfections when you're aiming for a realistic design. Ugh, and I have so far still to go. That's a 9.5 out of 10 for this masterpiece. The third category is one for the number crunchers and those who grew up playing top trumps. It's the pithily named Specification Criteria Exceeded category. And the category winner here is the M31 series by F Cave Troll. It also came third place overall, by the way. This is a curiously and noticeably Germanic design in a British design contest, and that's fully included in the law that was submitted with the design, complete with appropriate awkwardness and denials of any Nazi sympathies. This Jerry and Ebola hat also tried to break my scoring system for this category. No, really. I actually hadn't accounted for a design scoring as many points as this one did, and by rights it should have got an 11 or even a 12 out of 10, but it has to settle with 10 out of 10. Quite how FK Troll managed to fit quite so much 25 pounder and 3 inch ammo in this thing is simply beyond me, surpassing the points cap for ammo storage on both counts. It also hit the points cap for rate of fire, internal fuel capacity, APC crew space, and gun depression to boot. And it picked up rare, in this round, points for armour protection and one for speed as well. All this alone would have been enough to secure first place in this category, but the M31 is not done. No, no. You see there were bonus points available for having no rotating turret on the grounds of simplicity of manufacture, which this design took advantage of, and yet further bonus points for making zero structural changes between all variants, which the M31 also achieves. There's no variable fixed turret here, which was the only permissible way of adjusting internal space on a casemate type design, in this particular challenge anyway. It's all very impressive indeed. These bonus points push this extremely <coughs> German <coughs> efficient design well past the 10 out of 10 threshold. Our fourth and final category is the Proving Grounds, and our winner in this category is the Triskele series by Clockyard. The Proving Grounds round seemed to be impossible to score above 8 out of 10 on under the current criteria for this round of teabag. But Clockyard and his Triskele series obviously didn't get that memo. Almost half the entrants hit that 8 out of 10 ceiling in this round, but only one, the Triskele, smashed through it and scored a victorious 9. In this round, I took your heaviest and therefore presumably least mobile variant out onto the sandbox testing area and put it through its paces. You're now watching the Triskele Acolyte the 25-pounder SBG variant, on its run. Despite a seriously suspect-looking suspension setup, which looked very collapsed to me, this design made short work of the vast majority of the course. Acceleration felt ample, even spirited, even in the heaviest variant, and reverse speed and acceleration were all found to be immensely satisfactory. All trenches were crossed successfully, steering at low speed was a breeze, although neutral steering wasn't possible because of clutch braking. Sadly, the design was slightly let down by only average hill climbing ability. I confess I fully expected the suspension to be too soft and compressed at rest to be of any practical use, but boy was I wrong. The Acolyte handles the bumps, large and small, with ease and grace. 
Finally, the gun handling was everything we wanted it to be, so the Triskele gets full marks for that too. That's 9 out of 10 for the Triskele series. Congratulations. So, with our category winners now well and truly celebrated and appreciated, let's move on to the overall runner-up and winner. Our teabag round two runner-up is... None other than the SIMC A23 Cockatiel series by Boom and Doom. An extremely solid all-round entry, which epitomises the philosophy that championships are won by consistently putting good scores on the table, not by pulling off the occasional dazzling win. Unfortunately, however, that just wasn't quite enough to win this time. While the Cockatiel never scored high enough to win in any given category, it was consistently in the top 5 and never scored less than 7 out of 10. This all adds up to a highly respectable 32.75 out of 40 score. The sales pitch for this design was excellent, fully in character, framed as an audio transcript from the company's lead engineer, charming in style with plenty of facts and figures, as well as doing a good job of selling the design while retaining a suitable level of British candour. This pitch was only let down by the pictures, included which were too few and lacked any form of notable editing to improve them or add detail. The A23 scored 9 out of 10 in this category. Looks-wise, the Cockatiel series is gorgeous, and was one of the high scorers in the aesthetics category. It's a larger design, giving lots of room for outstanding levels of detail. It looks the part too, being both convincingly early war and with plenty of nods to British tank design. It scored well on both these points, although with some room for improvement. Bonus points were awarded for that handmade driver's position pieced together from structural components to give a unique look, giving a score overall of 8.75 out of 10 for aesthetics. As you'd expect from our runner-up, the Cockatiel scored well for specification criteria exceeded too, with plenty of points in armour, fuel capacity, rate of fire, ammo storage, crew space and gun depression. It scored less well for speed and failed to pick up any bonus points as it utilises a turret and the TD variant was sadly over 6 foot in height. That's 8 out of 10 in this section. Finally, the A23 hit the proving grounds and found itself struggling just a little more than most, unfortunately. Acceleration and top speed were found a little wanting, as was hill climbing ability. Still, the suspension made adequate if bumpy work of the obstacles and trenches posed no problem whatsoever. Gun handling was also found to be top notch. The Cockatiel scored 7 out of 10 in this category. Your runner up, ladies and gentlemen. The SIMC A23 Cockatiel by Boom and Doom. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. The winner of Teabag Round 2 and the design that will be put into series production with immediate effect. The name that shall strike fear into the hearts of the Wehrmacht is... The Triskele Series by Clockyard. Our resident master in the Proving Grounds proved to be not far off the pace in other categories as well and was a runner-up in two categories and scored well in the fourth. Truly a masterclass in tank design by Clockyard, who has clearly read his collection of tank books, not just bought them. I, however, have so many books I have never gotten round to reading, it's embarrassing. But not so for Clockyard. He is our round two champion. The sales pitch for this design was top tier stuff and yielded only to the Photoshop skills of the Crucible entry. That said, it's a close second as there are some well-done custom-edited pictures here too, like this old photograph, complete with description of uh, smell, and this picture of a sealed envelope the entry was supposedly arrived in. All very cool. Plenty of depth and description here too, and very good salesmanship for the most part as well. This submission scored 9 out of 10 in most criteria, and knocked it out of the park on being in character. I can't wait to hear more from the madmen of Tulov Industries. The Triskele series scored 9.25 out of 10 for their sales pitch. Aesthetically, the Triskele designs are all great. They fell just short of being my favourites. In fact, this category was their weakest one. But they are still very accomplished and good looking designs with plenty of detail. I did feel they looked a little modern in some places for the early war British. The Tank Destroyer variant especially seems at least mid if not late war looking to me. There are a good number of British tank design cues here, but not quite as many as the Sarastas and a couple of the others that were unmistakably British. The detail is excellent across all three variants though, 
and they are simultaneously unique and yet also good looking designs with no small amount of flair. I also liked that they each very much have their own identities whilst all being built on the same whole. Clockyard Design scored 8.25 out of 10 in this category. Until the M31 rolled up and broke my scoring system, the Triskele series was heading for a category win in specification criteria exceeded as well. This was one of the fastest designs on offer, with even the heavy SPG variant able to break 20 miles an hour with ease. Armour was better than the minimum requirement, and fuel reserves were ample. Both the SPG and TD got full marks for rate of fire and gun depression, and also scored very highly for ammo stowage. The APC variant also scored full points for available crew space. However, the Triskele series uses a turret for the gun variants, which means that they lose out on the available bonus points there. As runner-up in this category, the Triskele series scored 9.5 out of 10. Finally, we already know that the Triskele series are the masters of the Proving Grounds section, scoring an unmatched 9 out of 10 in that category. With a hugely impressive total point score of 36 out of 40, bearing in mind that a perfect score is purposely impossible in Teabag, I give you the winner of Teabag Round 2 and Great Britain's new universal gun carrier, the Triskele Arbiter, Acloit and Arachnid. As for this round's honourable mention, that goes to the M1A4 series by Eta 320. For those of you who don't know, Eta 320 is something of an up-and-coming YouTuber who specialises in all things tanks because he just loves them. He's done some really fun sprocket videos and also has produced some seriously well-researched mini-documentaries on historical tanks. The effort, he, the effort he puts in really shows and I highly recommend checking out his channel, which I have linked to in the video description. If you subscribe to him and hit the notification bell, you'll be the first to know when his video on taking part in this challenge goes live. That's all for this round, and for this video folks. See you back in 1940 for the next challenge in a few days. Take care out there.